right, well, this morning, my message is uh, actually about the cross. Now, I want to I tell you that, that, that the cross covers a lot of ground, amen? Um, the, the cross, you can talk about the cross when it comes to salvation. You can talk about the cross when it comes to sanctification. But what I need you to understand is this, is that without the cross, we're, no, we're not a child of God. Without the cross, we have nothing but being a slave to fear. Without the cross, there is no crossing. Uh, you know how the, the words to the song said, you split the sea so that I could walk right through it. That's what the cross did, really. The cross split the sea that divided us from the presence of God and, and where we were and opened up the pathway to give us access to be able to be gained back into the presence of God. And that's really what I want to speak to you about this morning regarding the cross and and specifically the ministry of reconciliation. So that's the word that the Lord has given me this morning. And I'll probably talk about the cross for the next couple of Sundays. But this scripture right here in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want you to know that the enemy does not want your past to be able to be passed away. You, you get that. He, he, one of his tactics that Satan does is he tries to hold over us or allow a dark cloud to hover over us that reminds us of our past and where we were back when we were in the world and all of the bad things that we did and all of the people that we hurt. And he wants to try to continue to cover us with a cloud of condemnation and guilt. But I have to tell you this morning that that's not what the word of God teaches about people that are truly born again. Amen. And in the next verse, it says all things are of God. So it says all things have all things have passed away. All things are become new and all those new things. Are of God, amen, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now I'm going to define reconciliation for you here in a moment, but I want to I want to just encourage you to understand that the Apostle Paul says he was given the ministry of reconciliation, but can I tell you that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation? And what does that mean? It means that God has sent Jesus and has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he wants that truth to be planted inside of your hearts. And he wants you to also operate in the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? Well, it means that, I don't know, maybe maybe somebody that Gabby goes to school with. Or maybe somebody that Jace met in martial arts. Or maybe somebody that Elijah goes to school with. And even though he goes to a Christian school, did you realize that there's a lot of people that go to Christian schools and they ain't really, they don't know the Lord. And number two, if they act like they know the Lord, they ain't really serving the Lord. Maybe somebody a hunter hangs out with that they don't know Jesus. Now listen, this is the thing. We either believe this story is real or we don't. We either believe that Jesus had to come to die for sinners or we don't really believe that. And if we do believe that, then the word of God also teaches that if they aren't reconciled to God through Christ, then that means that they are going to face, they're going to face an eternal Judgment and eternal hell. And so in that sense, God has placed the ministry. If you're a Christian tonight, this morning, if you're, if you're a true believer, if you've really been saved and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, then you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. God wants to take you and put you in the places where you're going to enter into and use you to see people come to Christ. Amen. So here's a little definition for reconciliation. This has just come straight out of the out of the New Testament Greek. The business of money changers is one concept behind reconciliation. An adjustment of a difference and a restoration to favor. And here's the restoration of, of the favor of God to sinners that repent and put their trust in the death of Christ. Now, I told Danielle I was going to go bring her the microphone, even though she was back there because I wanted her to sing a song. She said, don't do it, Matt, because you're going to mess me up. All right. So I'm going to assume that Naya can sing this song. Uh, what, how did that song go? It's an old song, and you should know it because it's old school. But it, he... he I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He he paid a debt I he didn't know. You don't know that song? Okay. That's cool. I'll, I'll, sing I'll sing it for you. I'll sing it for you. No, she don't want to sing it. She don't want to do it. She said, okay, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Right? She said, yeah. 
Yeah, there you go. Praise God. And we're going to just let them sing through the walls. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 To wash my sins away And now I sing A brand new song Amazing grace My Jesus paid the debt That I could never pay Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Oh, is that going to get you going? So that's what reconciliation is. See, there was a debt. There was an adjustment of a difference financially when you're looking at that. There was, an, there was a debit to my account. And Jesus came to rectify that problem and to reconcile that problem. There was, there was something placed in the account that made it right. Amen. I, I owed a debt that I could not pay. And he paid a debt that he did not owe. And so that's the ministry of reconciliation. That there was a separation that took place. Amen. But because of the fall of man. But praise God. God is in the ministry of reconciliation. And he's bringing us back into relationship with him. So that when, whenever you get saved, I've been talking about this verse of scripture quite a bit now uh, here lately, but in 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, it says this, that he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. When you get saved, amen, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your spirit and the two, your spirit and his spirit become entangled, amen. I want you to know that, that your spirit is made new. And, and I got some scripture in here that's going to talk about that, but I want you to know that you've been renewed at the level of your spirit, amen. And as you and I continue to grow in Christ and walk in him, he's doing a miracle on the rest of us, amen. He's transforming our mind and the way that we think, and hallelujah, even though it looks like the body's decaying, there will be a day, amen, when we will receive a glorified body. Now, I want to say this about your spirit. It's the eternal aspect of who you are. Your, your spirit is not going to die. Your existence will never die. The individual known as Sabrina Pleslaw will not die. The individual known as Edwin Kirk Young will never die. Hallelujah. And that, that person is never going to die because you are created and, 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 and you are an individual and that person is never going to die. Now, the Bible does talk about a final death, but it's not the way some people teach it. You're not just going to be absolved and dissolved. No, no, no. There's going to be an eternal existence. See, the Bible talks about the final death, but that's talking about the judgment of sin, and it's talking about the second death, that's called the white throne judgment. Your spirit, man, is never going to die, though. You are an eternal spiritual being. And so what that is talking about is actually talking about separation from God. And so there's a physical death, and there's also a spiritual death. All right? And the spiritual death is what I want to talk about. But let me just say this, too. I want to say this. Spiritual death is separation from God's presence. Mm. <laughs> now, I want you to think about that for a second. Is there times in your life that you've been lonely? Is there times in your life that you felt so alone, especially before you knew the Lord? Even sometimes after we've known the Lord. Now, we shouldn't be walking around like that. Amen. Did, as a matter of fact, did y'all notice that the way the atmosphere changed a little bit? Mm. It didn't really have anything to do with what I said other than just acknowledging that something was there. But then in response to us acknowledging that, Sister Brenda started walking around the church. Brother yeah. Kirk was praying. Amen. Some of y'all started praying, moved forward. What happened was, was that we broke through. Amen. And I want to encourage you with that. And I thank the Lord that he, that he allowed that to happen because it's a good opportunity for us to understand that there's going to be times in your life that the enemy is going to bombard you and he's going to come against you. And he doesn't want you to understand the ministry of reconciliation. He doesn't want you to understand who Christ, who you are in Christ. He doesn't want you to understand who Christ is in you. And he wants you to kind of live your old way of thinking. 
And he wants to try to be able to drive you back to your past. But the word of God says that all things are passed away and that all things have become new. There's a new way to move forward in the things of God. So I want you to know, though, before Christ, have you, do you remember? I, there were some low times in my life, some very low times. And during those times, the enemy is trying to bombard you with feelings of hopelessness. He's trying to bombard you with feelings of depression and oppression trying to beat you down and make you feel like you're all alone and you don't have anybody or anything. That's a lie from Satan because the Amen. word of God says that we've been reconciled yes. to God through Jesus Christ. And so I do want you to, I do want to say this, not so much for you personally, because I believe that most of the people in here are saved, but for the people out there, that's why the ministry of reconciliation is so important for you in your life that the Lord would would open up doors of opportunity for you to be able to minister the truth. Because listen, if you think those times of loneliness were bad in your life, imagine eternal separation from the presence of God. Wow. Amen. I, I don't think that we think about it enough. It's very serious. Yeah. It's very serious because no man is promised tomorrow. The word of God says you're not promised tomorrow. Right. Today is the day. Multitudes in the valley of decision. And so I think that it's important that we keep that in our heart and in our mind when we think about that. Amen. And so I got a couple of concepts here that I want to talk to you about when it comes to reconciliation. And you can see this word cherubim keeps showing up in these three passages of scripture I'm going to use. And some of you have heard me teach on this before, but I'll, I'll probably be talking about the cherubim again on Wednesday because we're talking about the glory of God and the cherubim are very associated with the glory of God. But in these particular three verses of scripture, uh, I want to make a point that the cherubim are associated with the presence of God. And when we're talking about reconciliation, we're talking about man was, see, if sin separates, this is really my main thought. If you're taking notes, I want, because you know me, I'll use a lot of words and you might not catch my main thought. So let me make sure I give it to you. If sin separates, the blood reconciliates. Yes. Okay, you got that? So if sin separates man from the presence of God, the blood of Jesus reconciles man to the presence of God. And so what we're here looking at here is, is these cherubim and their association with the presence of God. And the first one is Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And it says this. I want you to know we're talking about two things. We're talking about number one, separation from God's presence. But number two, reconciliation. So look, here it is. This is after the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And it says, he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims. And a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So what it's saying is, is that mankind now has fallen into sin and sin is separating him from the presence of God. And God is not allowing man to come back into the Garden of Eden where the presence of God is. And he puts cherubim there, which according to the word of God, protect the anointing protect the presence of God and these cherubim are forms of angels and there's a flaming sword that's preventing entry of sinful man to get back into the presence of God. Now this is the first layer or first step of God's ministry of reconciliation. First he has to show us sin separates us from his presence. And then immediately, now listen, I got a picture in here and let's not make fun of the picture because this is just one person's idea of what it might have looked like. And I don't think that that's really the way it looked like. But the point that I want you to see, first of all, you see how they're clothed in animal skins? See, because the Word of God teaches that the first sacrifice, I believe this with all of my heart, was the skins that God provided for Adam and Eve because they tried to clothe themselves, and we're going to look at that a little closer in a second, with fig leaves. But God provided skins for them. But you see that glowing figure in the back? There's a sword up there. I don't think it looked like that, but I want you to see the point that this cherubim, which was a form of an angel with a flaming sword, is preventing them and they're being, from getting back to the presence of God and is, and is is driving them away from the presence of God, but there's a little glimmer of hope in the fact that God provided these skins for them, and as we move forward in the story of God, we begin to realize that God's story of reconciliation is based upon 
the system of sacrifice. Amen? So here's the cherubim. The next time we are mentioned to the cherubim, these angels comes out of Exodus chapter uh, 25, verse 16 through 22. So I'm going to go ahead and read that to you real quick. Exodus chapter 25, verse 16 through 22. It says, And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. You know what testimony is right there? Anybody? Huh? Want to say it? Shout it out there like that? It's the Ten Commandments, okay? So that's just another way to say the Ten Commandments. So the Lord says, you're going to put the testimony into the ark. Can you see that? A little too small for you? Let me go ahead and pick that up for you a little bit. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. A cubit and a half the breadth thereof. So two, it's about the about elbow to fingertip, two, uh, two and a half of those long, and then two, a one and a half wide. So you see it's about, and, and I got a picture of it, okay? And, and the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. So the last time we hear about the cherubim, they're standing at the gate of the entry into the Garden of Eden, and they have a flaming sword, and they're preventing access back to the presence of God. But if you really study this out that I'm trying to explain to you right here this morning, what you're going to realize is this, is that God is bringing man back. God is bringing his presence back closer to humanity through the nation of Israel that he created from the man named Abraham. All right. And he says, you shall make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. You shall make them and the two ends uh, of the mercy seat and make one cherub on one end, the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. You see that right there? I want you to see that. That's the big part right there. There I will meet with you. Now you realize what a privilege it is to be a New Testament Christian. That really all you had to do was put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus and ask forgiveness of your sin and the Holy Spirit moved into your heart. And, and listen, we all go through it that sometimes we're feeling down, we're feeling oppressed, right? But one whisper of his name, I'm telling you, I'm talking about when it comes from deep down inside of our belly, one whisper of his name, and the next thing you know, you, you, he's, he's been there the whole time. He's there to minister to us. He's there to strengthen us. He's there to give us the power and the endurance that we need to get up and to keep on moving. But look at all that God went through in order to get his presence back to Israel. He says, There's, that's where I'm going to meet with you. I will commune with you from above the mercy seat between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the testimony of all things, which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see. Now, there's a, there's another aspect to this that I want you to know about. And it's in the book of Leviticus. We're not going to turn there, but it's in Leviticus chapter 16. It's called the Day of Atonement. Many of you are familiar with that, but maybe some of you aren't. Once a year, see, he's given them how to build the tabernacle right now because he's preparing them to enter into the promised land. And this is going to be part of what they're supposed to do. This is part of their worship, okay? But, but whenever they enter in, once a year, there's something called the Day of Atonement. And the high priest was the only one that could enter in beyond the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was. And when he brought the Ark, of, when, he, when he went in there, he had to bring a sacrifice for his own sin. Then he brought a sacrifice for the sin of the people of the nation of Israel. And he would sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat. So I got a couple of pictures for you. So here's, this is one artist's idea of what the mercy seat would have looked like. Or the Ark of the Covenant. You see, the Ark is the box. The mercy seat is the top on top of it. The cherubim are the two angels that are on top. And you see how their, their wings are stretched forward and they're touching one another. It's hard to see it, but if you look real closely at their faces, their faces look kind of like this. Because you see, they're looking down on top of the mercy seat. All right. Here's another picture of what this is. Somebody made this. 
And this is what they, they probably took the actual measurements. I would imagine, I can't prove it, but I would imagine they took the two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and they built the arc, okay, which is the box. And then they got it twisted off to the side so you can see that the mercy seat was actually a lid, you see there, and that it would sit on top. And, and then they have the, the two angels facing one another with their faces towards. Now what, now what I'm about to do is I want you to see, I want you to see what it would have looked like because look, they got, you know what's in there, and I know I've said this many times, but some of you are kind of new, that what's on the inside of the box? The law, the Ten Commandments. The Bible says, and especially in James chapter 2, verse 10, if any man is going to live according to the law, he must keep the entirety of it. That means it doesn't matter if you didn't cheat on your wife, if you didn't lie, if you weren't disrespectful to your parents, if you even wanted your neighbor's Mercedes Benz or coveted it in your heart, then you failed the law. The point, one of the main points to the law was to reveal to us that we needed Jesus. Amen. And so, but once a year, I want you to see this. Look at this right here. I got a little effect right here. Boom. See that blood right there? Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat, changing the place of a place of judgment. Because you got to understand the law was broken on the inside of the box because no man could keep the law. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to keep and to fulfill the law. He didn't come to abolish the law. The book of Romans says in chapter 8, to those, that walk in the, those of us that walk in the spirit, the law is fulfilled through us. Because by the grace and the mercy of Christ, if we will keep our eyes on Jesus, amen, he's already fulfilled it for us. But not only that, he will pour grace into our life to give us strength to where we can live a life that is pleasing in the eyes of the Father. And so once a year, amen, at the Day of Atonement, the blood is applied to the mercy seat. Now these cherubim's faces are not looking through the box into the broken law. Instead, they're looking at the blood. Amen. I'm going somewhere with this. All right. Now, this is the next verse of Scripture. This is in the New Testament. This is Romans chapter 3, verse 25. I want you to see something right here. In Romans 3, verse 25, it says, whom God, he's talking about Jesus, has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Now, I want you to know this is that the scripture teaches and I think I'll put this verse in here, but I'm just going to say it now in Hebrews chapter 10. The blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. See, in the Old Testament, every year they had to do this whole Day of Atonement ritual. Every year, okay, it's the Day of Atonement. The high priest is going to go in there and he's going to put the blood on the mercy seat. And for one year, our sins are covered. If you go back and you read Hebrews 10, it says the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. If those sacrifices of the Old Testament could have done it, then they would have no longer had a consciousness of sin. And they would not have no longer had to continue to offer up these sacrifices. And what I need you to understand is this, is that if the enemy is trying to plague you in your mind about sin from your past, I need to tell you that he's a liar. Now, if you're actively living in the midst of a sinful lifestyle, then he ain't lying. <laughs> He's telling the truth. But once you truly repent, amen, and you and you get your sin under the blood of Jesus, I'm not talking about under the blood of a bull or a goat. I'm talking about under the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that he declares his righteousness for the remission of sins. The sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. God remembers your sin no more because he's placed your sin on Jesus when Jesus died at the cross. Amen. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament type. Amen. Jesus is the reconciliation. What I need you to understand is that God created Adam in his image and in his likeness. And when God created Adam, there was no sin in him. For there's no darkness nor shadow of turning in the Father of lights. There is no sin in God. Amen. And when he created Adam, he created him in his image and likeness, but then sin came into the world and it infected the entirety of the human race. God sent forth his own son in the express image of his glory. Jesus had no sin. You can't die for your sin. The Muslim martyr can't die for his own sin. I can't die for my sin because my blood is tainted with sin. Jesus 
had no sin. Therefore, as the last Adam, when he offered up his sacrifice for the sin of humanity, God was able to wipe away all that sin and even all that sin that had been, look at that, of the sins of the past through the forbearance of God. God was actually waiting on this day when Jesus would humbly offer his life as a sacrifice. All those sins, even in Old Testament Israel, God was just forbearing them. It was almost like a credit system. Okay, we're going to roll them over to the next year. We'll roll them over to the next year. We're going to roll them over to the next year. But then when Jesus comes, wipe the safe clean. Go ahead, get the accountant out. Boom, the debt has been paid. Kettle less die. Yeah. Paid in full. Hallelujah. Yeah. Next. <laughs> He's looking for the next one because what Jesus did, our sins are remitted. It's important that you understand this. I'm telling you the word of God this morning. The word of God says you're not guilty if you're in Christ. Amen. The word of God says that you've been forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. The enemy doesn't want you to grab a hold of this. He doesn't want you to get a revelation of this. He wants you to walk around <clears throat> under condemnation and guilt. Yes. Okay, I, you know, y'all can't appreciate this, but Aaron can. Christopher probably can. I, I went to that Cornerstone thing, uh, 40 years celebration, and Steve List was speaking on Friday night. And he said, he said, the enemy wants you in the mully grubs. Y'all remember that? Y'all the D from New Zealand in the mully grubs. And what, what does that mean? I don't know. I'm, I'm just so sad. I'm going to go eat worms and die. That's where the enemy wants to keep people. He wants to keep them in a place where they're just miserable and they're beat down and they feel unworthy and they feel condemned. But he's a liar and the father of lies. And we'll get a revelation of this. Then the whole thing is. The Holy Spirit will start to do a work on the inside of our life and he'll start to free us. And that's what true justification by faith means. To believe what God says about you. Amen. So look, I want you to see this about this word propitiation. I got a little effect right here because the word in the Greek, literally, you could say it means mercy seat. Now, it's a long story to get there. I'm not going to go there, but I want you to know whom God has set forth to be a mercy seat through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God. Now, look, I got I got another graphic. Now look at this. This is probably one of my favorite scenes out of the passion of the Christ. I didn't agree with everything about the passion of the Christ. <coughs> And this is a Hollywood scene, but I'm trying to make a point. I'm pretty sure they had a word uh, a dialogue on that scene right here. I, I'm pretty sure that somebody says in the crowd, look at, I think, I, I don't know that they called him a fool or not, but look, how, look at this fool. Look, look how he clings to his cross. But you see that pic? Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about that, but look at that, that old rugged cross. Then you see that. I'll never forget seeing that scene. And how it impacted me. It's almost like he's, he's hugging it. It's like he's, he's connected to it. Yes. And he refuses to let it go. Amen. Because see this is the father's will. Even if this is Hollywood eyes. I'm trying to tell you there's a principle here. That, that he's clinging to this cross. Because this is the father's will. Yes. For the joy that was set before him. He endured the shame because he knew that the joy was connected to you, was connected to me, that he would be able to reconcile us back into the presence of God. Now, this is where I'm going to get a little bit kind of funny with this situation. Not funny, but I want to make a point that, see, Jesus has become the propitiation. Now, this is a picture of Jesus because, see, now when the Father looks, because it said that Jesus is the mercy seat. When the Father, I need you to understand something. Previously, when, when the presence of God through the cherubim was looking at the mercy seat, he saw the blood annually from the, from the animals. But what I need you to understand is this, is that now if you are in Christ, whenever the whole, when God the Father looks at you, he looks at the sacrifice of Jesus and he no longer sees your guilt. He no longer sees your failure. He sees the victory of Jesus. This is what you need to understand, that he's, no, he's not looking at you the way that the enemy wants you to believe that he's looking at you. Amen. In order for us to be right with the Lord, if we are living in active sin, we need to repent of it and we need to let the Lord deliver us from it. Amen. He's already delivered us from it. We need to repent from it. We need to turn away from it. Amen. Praise God. Because he's not okay with us living in sin. And you know what the word of God says? What is sin, preacher? I'm going to tell you what James said. To him that knows to do right, doesn't do it to him in his sin. Yes. Lord, forgive us. Yes. And then once he forgives us, he wants to give us grace so that we'll walk 
right before him. But once it's under the blood of Jesus, I need you to understand something. The enemy might be lying, whispering and telling you you're guilty, but that's not what the Lord sees. Amen. The Lord doesn't see your guilt. The Lord sees the innocent sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. And that's where it says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. So I want you to see these five things. Number one, in sin, the separation, Adam and Eve lost their glory. We talked about that last week. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. God provided animal skins. And then, and then in the New Testament, the scripture says we're clothed in Christ. And that ultimately, we're going to receive a glorified body. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. He said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Isn't that what the enemy wants to do, though, when he does that? See, that's what sin does. It separates us from the presence of God. He tries to make us feel unworthy. And so whether we realize it or not, we come up with all kinds of ways to hide ourselves from the presence of God. Right? I mean, what I'm look, you can fill in all kinds of things in the blank. We allow... Listen, temptation comes and entices us through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. These things come towards us and he promises a lying story. He says it's going to, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just going to try to be real with you. He's going to promise to young people, man, you just don't even know what you're missing out on. Yeah. Dude, that girl likes you or that boy likes you. And look how good looking he is. Any girl in this school would love to have that boy for their boyfriend. I'm just making up some kind of crazy story. It's completely made up. Okay. That works. Okay, yeah. Vice versa. Oh, man, that girl thinks you're so hot, dude. <laughs> I really talk now, man. And if you, dude, why are you, you're a fool, man. Look, everybody else is over here kissing on girls, kissing on boys, touching on each other. Come on. You, you, what, what are you thinking? Just because your mom and your daddy told you something, man, what are you thinking? You fool. And, and he makes all these promises to you. And how do we know so much, Pastor Matt? Give me a break, dude. I was in the eighth grade one time. I was a freshman in high school. I can't tell you the stupid stuff I did. And because then y'all would think, y'all might think that that's actually cool and it wasn't cool. Because what it is, is it's opening up doorways. You see, he, he paints the picture and what he tells you is actually a lie. And what you end up getting is the opposite. And I wasn't going to get into this because this is from Wednesday night. But he comes as an angel of light, offering light. But in reality, what the result is darkness. So he comes in, he offers a good time. And Listen, our flesh enjoys sin for a season, yes. Yes. but then we're left empty and now we're in bondage. And like some people are preaching nowadays, now you got friends. <laughs> Meaning you open up the door, Paul said, don't give place to the devil. And listen, we can sit here and argue all day long whether the devils get in, believers or unbelievers. I don't really care where they are. I don't want no devil nowhere around me. I don't want no devil on me. I don't want no devil in me. I don't want, let me say that, I don't want no devil influencing me and controlling me to the point where it tells me what to do and I listen to it instead of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to preach to you. Because I don't care what your position is on demon spirits. Every last person in this room has been influenced by demonic spirits at a level in their walk where the devil told them what they do. And they've been, yes, sir. And they went and they performed the very action that they knew they were not supposed to perform because it was in contradistinction to God's written word. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why Jesus said it is written, that's good. liar. Come on. That's good. That's good. But we try to find ways to hide. So he comes and he sneaks in and he says, this is going to be so good. It's going to feel so good when in reality we open up the door and boom, it results in darkness. It results in, in oppression. Yes. And then now we feel separation from God. So what we do is because it stimulates our physical. Listen, do you realize, listen, I'm not trying to get all medical on you, but, but do you realize why antidepressants work for a short period of time? Because temporarily they increase your neurotransmitters, your serotonin, your norepinephrine. These are what you call chemicals in your brain that supposedly stabilize mood. But if they really work the way they were supposed to, you wouldn't be on a constant roller coaster ride with medication changes. If they were really going to work like they were supposed to, you, they just put you on one and it would work. But it never works that way. There's a constant barrage of changes because it, 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 that's not how. I, so that, that's a similar thing whenever you commit acts of sin. That's what certain drugs do. Certain drugs increase your neuro, your neurotransmitters. They increase 
increase your your dopamine. Yes. They increase your your serotonin, and they elevate your mood. Hey, listen, a new girlfriend can do that for a short period of time. A new boyfriend can do that for a short period of time. If you ain't been around long enough, let me just go ahead and warn you, young people, that all of a sudden, and you'll, you'll swear that's what you need, and the devil will convince you that's what you need, man. You need another woman. You need another man. You need to feel them butterflies floating around in your tummy again. You need to feel that little momentary high in your brain. And guess what? Even if you marry that woman, even if you marry that man, you ain't going to wake up every morning with your brain full of serotonin. Amen. Don't believe the lie. But now you didn't open the door. And now you've been separated from the presence of God. And so now instead of the joy of the Lord being your strength, you're like, I got to walk back to another bump. I got to get a bump. What is the bump you go and get? What does that even mean, a bump, preacher? Some type of way to increase the mood. Some kind of way to increase the feeling. Uh, whether it's a drug. <laughs> Whether it's I'm going to go get another kiss from that boy and it don't ever stop with a kiss. Listen, if you flirt with the devil, if you let the devil kiss on you, it's going to turn into more than it was supposed to. People get bumps, I'm sure, out of playing video games. Anything that you can, and what, what is my point to all this? I wasn't even supposed to spend this much time on this, but I'm trying to make a point. Anything that will allow you to try to hide yourself, to escape, and to forget the reality of where you're living. Yeah. A boyfriend will do that. A girlfriend will do that. Another marriage will do that. <laughs> wow. Don't even get me started down that road. I'm not telling you don't get married. I'm telling you, as a matter of fact, if you're supposed to get married, please get married. <laughs> number one. And, but number two, don't go into the marriage thinking that that's what's going to fix everything because Jesus is the only thing that can fix everything. Amen. And let it be understood that you're going to need to learn how to give all to Jesus and learn how to hide yourself in the sacrifice of Christ and not try to hide yourself in some sinful activity. All right. What can you hide yourself in? Just about anything you want to fill the blank in. I spent 15 minutes on this slide. It was supposed to give it to anything that you can find to try to hide yourself and you swear is going to bring you happiness. It could be a Netflix series. It could be a Saints football game. Not really the Saints. I don't know how Dallas is going on, but you're not going to get a serotonin bump from the Saints. I promise you that. You won't get that, all right? So don't even try. <laughs> you know, I might become a Dallas fan when they win it. All right, okay. Well, there you go. So anyway, here we go. Something that you're putting yourself into and you're trying to hide the pain. Y'all get the point? Yeah. Listen to this one. Yeah. So what they did was when they realized that they, that's what they did. They made for themselves fig leaves because they knew that they were naked. They knew that they were separated. They made aprons for themselves. And that's really whatever we were just talking about, whether it was video games, boyfriend, girlfriend, a new marriage, a new job, a new something, a new car. Oh, the leather smells so good, right? Whatever it is, that's the apron that I'm trying to cover up. That, and, and listen, there's a whole lot to this. I don't have time <laughs> to get into it right now, but... I mentioned it, I think, a couple of weeks ago about the Masons. I never saw this before, but they wear that apron. I'm telling you right now, that apron that they wear, that loincloth that they wear, is directly connecting itself to these fig leaves right here. They are saying something. I don't care whether anybody believes. By the way, I'm going to be doing a teaching on the current state of Israel. There's going to be, I'm going to be doing it on Sunday nights. It's probably going to take me three times to do it. Y'all are invited to come. If y'all want to come, I'm going to do it in here. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to say some things that people ain't going to be, they're not going to like. I'm actually going to put it on video. I never would have done that in the past. People, it's going to, people are going to be very, maybe even momentarily confused by some of it. But in the end, what we need to understand is this. The word of God says this in Revelation 17. For God has put it in their heart yeah. to do these things. Yeah. Because Daniel said, what is written will come to pass. Yeah. As God's people, we are to pray. We are to pray that God's will upon the earth That's will it. be done. Yeah. But okay, let, let me not go off on that <laughs> rabbit trail. Let me just stay focused. But it'll probably start in the next Sunday night or the following Sunday night. And I just want you to, and I'm letting y'all know that I'm not going to do it on Wednesday nights. That way, if y'all don't want to come, y'all don't have to come. But if you do want to come, it'll be there. And then if you want to just wait for the video to come out, it's going to be on video too. Amen. And I'm going backwards a little bit 
And I'm going to cover, I'm going to start at Solomon's fall. And let me tell you why I'm starting there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because that's in the Bible. I want to get us to the place where we are right now in the last few hundred years or, or a couple of thousand years or a thousand years of history of Jerusalem. Because there's a lot of things that have happened in Jerusalem that people are even completely unaware of. All right. Uh, but in order to get there, I feel like we need to start with Solomon yeah. and the division of the king. All right. Anyway, that's another story. All right. So the eyes of them both were open and these fig leaves that they tried to make an apron for themselves to cover themselves. What I need you to understand about masonry, what I need you to understand about man's attempt to cover themselves and we're going to cover ourselves is that man is creating a society that has kicked or rejected God out of it. That's what the Tower of Babel is all about. That's what the New World Order is all about. That's what the things that we're seeing, whether we realize it or not, on the face of the earth are all about. It's written in the Word of God. That's why I spend time on it. And it's happening before our very eyes. We are living in the last days, church. Yes. And we need to wake up. We're living in the last days, and we got to understand that there's a society being built that has basically kicked God out of it. And that's what this is all about. They're trying to fix and remedy their own thing. You can do it as individuals by trying to hide in whatever you're hiding in, but society's more than happy to help you. Right? Hollywood's got a new thing coming. Everybody's got a new thing coming. They're more than happy to help us to hide ourselves in the little places that they're fixing for us. So, but God says no. God, and unto Adam also to his wife, did the Lord make, God make coats of skins and clothing. They made aprons out of fig leaves. God made skins out of animals. Yes. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if you go back to Genesis chapter one, what you'll learn is that man and beast alike were herbivores. He gave every plant, every tree as food for them. They weren't carnivores. There was no reason now could have God spoken these skins into existence. Absolutely. He spoke the whole world into existence. But it makes more sense when you look at the whole of scripture to believe that this is the first sacrifice. That God created the first sacrifice in order to cover Adam and Eve with the, with the skins of an innocent animal that had nothing to do with their sin. Because Jesus had nothing to do with our sin and he came to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Yes. So man's going to try to fix it his way. But God said, that's what I'm trying to tell you. You can try to fix all of the problems in your life any way you want to. You that are watching on video, it's not going to work. You're still going to end up with an empty spot in your heart because you're searching and you're seeking for something to fill a spot that only Jesus can fill. Because that's what you were created for. You were created to have a relationship with God, to worship God, and to glorify Him. Because God's either real or He's not. And if He is, He said, His glory will fill the earth. Amen. And so there's a whole world out there that are rejecting Him. And in the New Testament, it says this. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, listen, water baptism is the perfect outward symbol of what happens inwardly when you put your faith in Christ. So in God's mind, when you put your faith in Christ, the old man that was born of Adam dies, he's buried, and a new man is resurrected to newness of life. When we go into the baptismal waters, we're actually externally professing our faith of what's taking place spiritually when we put our faith in Christ. The old man that Matt was born of Elaine in 1966, born in sin from his father Adam, has now received Christ. And when he goes in the water, he's outwardly professing that he has chosen to follow Jesus. Can't give the mic to Danielle every time we need a song to sing. But well, as I saw, you can probably sing. Go ahead and turn it on. Go ahead. I have decided to follow Jesus. Y'all got it. Or Micah. One of y'all. Go ahead and turn it on. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back. No turn. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And I wish I would have known the secret when I was in junior high. Yeah. Or in high school. Yeah. Let me tell you the secret. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna tell you, I probably shouldn't do it because of time, but we we got we bought this timeshare a long time ago. They always want us to go sit down to upgrade something, but it's the same old gig, dude. They're trying to constantly to sell you something. Danielle done put her foot down and said, I'm not gonna talk to them people. Anymore. <laughs> For some reason, I felt like maybe we need to do this. And I said, look, this is what we're gonna do, Danielle. We're gonna pray and we're gonna flow in the spirit. We're going to flow in the spirit. We're going to have the right attitude. We're going to go in there. We know they're going to try to sell us something, but we don't need nothing, so we're not going to buy nothing. And what we're going to have, but this is the thing. We're not going to go in there in the flesh. We're going in in the spirit. So I walked in there, and this is what I wish that I would have known when I was y'all's age. Because see, somebody come up to me and say, and say, man, that girl over there likes you. And knowing what I know about the Lord, I'd be like, let me tell you something, bro. The Apostle Paul said, give no place to the devil. And I ain't trying to open up no door that, oh, you're a weird Jesus freak. That's right, brother. And if you don't get a hold of some of this, you're going to split hell wide open. And Jesus said that the worm doesn't die, the fire isn't quenched, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, don't none go with me. Hey, still I will follow. Don't none go with me. Still I will follow. That's right. Hallelujah. I walk up in there, and there's this young kid, and he's like, hey, how y'all doing today? I'm like, dude, I'm on an assignment today. <laughs> oh, man, the Lord sent me here to remind you about Jesus. And so we're still walking, and I said, the Lord wants me to tell you the good news. What are you, a Jehovah's Witness? I said, no, dude, I'm a Jesus freak. And the Lord sent me to let you know about the goodness of God. Now, before it's all over with, this dude starts opening up. Come to find out he was born in church, raised in church. Come to find out he even knows aliens ain't really aliens, but they're demons. Come on now. He's hiding all that stuff. He's hiding it, but as time comes over, all of a sudden the Lord starts uncovering. He won't look at me when he's talking. He got to look at Danielle. But nevertheless, hallelujah, the word of the Lord went forward. And when I was all said and done, I said, hold those things real close to your heart, brother, because it's going down. Yeah, wow. It's going down. Wow. Amen? Yeah. Anyway, Amen. don't none go with me. Yes, Still I yes, will follow. Yes. Let me tell you something, Hunter. You got the truth in your heart. Yes, Jace, yes. you got the truth yes. in your heart. Yes. Elijah, you got the truth. Yes. Gabby, you got the truth in your heart. Little Mikey, the truth of yes. Jesus is in your heart. Don't let no schoolboy kid on the playground try to tell you that he knows. No, they don't know. They're lost. They're lost. Yes. All right. So if you've been baptized into Christ, you've been clothed with him. Man tries to close himself, clothe himself with fig leaves. God clothes him with animal skins, which is a type of Jesus. When you put your faith in Christ, the old man dies and is buried with Jesus. And the new man is resurrected to newness of life. And it's like you put Jesus on. Amen. And now the father looks at you. He sees Jesus. Praise Amen. God. Just as we have been born in the image of the earthly. We also will bear the image of the heavenly. We talked about that last week, the glory of God. Good news is this, is that one day we're going to receive a glorified God. I believe that with all of my heart. Amen. Praise God. So your spirit was dead, but now it's alive. I want you to see. So we, we already talked about this scripture. It says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now, this is kind of hard to read a little bit because it might be a little small. Some of you up front might be able to see it. But this comes out of Ezekiel, which is an Old Testament book written somewhere around 700 BC and it's talking about the new covenant. So through the prophet, the Lord begins to predict or prophesy the coming of the new covenant that would be Jesus, okay? And so this is what God says, in the new covenant, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh then I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So before reconciliation, you were born of your mother in your, in your natural birth. You were born of Adam and you were born dead to the things of God. 
But the word of God teaches us, even in the old covenant that God promised that in the new covenant, he was going to do a new work yeah. that was going to change the inside of the person. That he was going to renew their spirit. That he was going to give them a new heart. Amen. And that he was going to put his spirit on the inside of them. And that that was going to give them the strength and the ability to do the yeah. things of God and to live for God. See, when you live for God, you're not, you can't do it in your own strength. Y'all yeah. understand that and believe that. I hope you do. Praise God. It needs to be through the grace of the Lord. Look at this scripture. It says in Colossians, you being dead in your sins in the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. It says in Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If you're saved here this morning, then the way that it had to have happened was you had to have heard something about the good news. You had to have believed what you were hearing. And when you believed with your heart, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit sealed you or came to live on the inside of you. And if you're born again this morning and the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of you, you're not the same as you used to be. Amen. The enemy might try to beat you up and try to get you to turn around. He might try to get you to quit following Jesus. He's not might, he is. Right. And he's doing it every single time that you wake up and all day long. But he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And if you and I will start to learn how to believe what the word of God says about us, the devil ain't got no chance because he's already defeated in the name of Jesus. Yes. But look at this. I like this scripture. This is Luke chapter 9, verse 59 and 60. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me or allow me first to go and bury my father. Look what Jesus says to him. Jesus says unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Wow. So what are you saying, Jesus? How are you going to serve? You know, can you hear the, the tractors right now? Can you hear your, your friends? The, pe the negative ones, you know what I'm talking about? The people that you, you don't hang out with negative people, right? But can you imagine your family members that don't know Jesus? Oh, so what, you going to follow Jesus? He's not even going to let you put me in the ground? Yeah. Jesus ain't got no problem with you putting your people in the ground. He'd much rather pull people out the ground. Maybe they might get Lazarus, hallelujah. But there's, he understands that people are going to die. Amen. That's not the issue. The issue is, is that he could perceive in this man's heart that there was something more. But first... In, the, in, in Spanish, they say, Primera, first, let me go ahead and put my dad in the ground. No, no, you're either going to follow after me or you're not. Okay, you, you get the point. He said, you think that I've come to bring peace upon the earth, name it a sword. And you're going to bring separation between father and son, between mother and daughter, between brother and sister. Because those people that stand in the way of your relationship with Jesus. So look, if you're going to meet this Thanksgiving, it's coming up with your family. And they're over there clowning you because you live for Jesus. And they're over there trying to beat you. Oh, you don't even come do stuff with us anymore that we used to do. You you don't hang out with us and do it. Yeah, I don't do that anymore because I've decided to follow Jesus and I'm not going backwards and I can still love you and have a relationship with you. But if you think I'm going to let you get in the way of me and my Jesus, you got another story because Jesus said, if you want to follow after me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow after me. He who seeks to save his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will gain eternal life. Hallelujah. That's, that's Jesus. Jesus said, no, let the dead bury the dead. Those spiritually dead people, they are, there's not, you know why? Because there's always going to be something else. Oh, I was going to come to church with you, sister, but, you know, such and such. I don't know. The saints are about to get whooped by the cowards, so I got to stay at home and watch the saints. Or, come on, uh, you know, or this is going to happen. It's always going to be something, is what I'm trying to say. Have you not learned that even as a Christian? That if you listen to the lies of the devil, you'd never make it to church. Would you? And every single time you turn in bed, oh my gosh, it's 2 o'clock. I woke up. I can't go to church today. And why? You can't take a nap this afternoon? It's church is not the only thing you have to do with serving the Lord. I get that. But the point is, it'll always be some excuse. I'm, I'm sure that the enemy tried to put excuses in your, in your way, way not to go meet with Russell. Okay. My point is, I'm sure he tried to put some excuses in your way, Sabrina. But you know, at some point in time, <laughs> Something happens. The devil's like, doggone it. My old tricks ain't working on me no more. 
Oh, I used to be able to get him so easy with this little thing right here. And now look at him. Oh, I'm going to have to try to come back and do something different. And he will. But the more you start to recognize that lion devil, amen, praise God. He's at least, at least you're making it work for it. Praise God. And the Lord will give us wisdom. All right. The old man versus the new man. In Genesis 126, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Right? And let him have dominion. And then look what it says here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. Adam lived 130 years. He begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. The point is, is that something happened in mankind. God originally created man in his image and likeness. But after the fall, now man is born in the image and likeness of Adam. There's a change that's take, put, taken place. I'll probably teach about this next week when I teach on the sinful nature. But our first birth in Adam, we're born in sin. We're born separated from God. And we're born with a sinful nature. But God has a plan, amen, to get yes. to make us new man. Look at this. I used the New King James Version. I, I hope that doesn't offend you. I did it for that one word right there, for that word conduct. Because the Old King James uses conversation. And I didn't like the way the NASB said it either. So I could have just put changed that one word, but here you go. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man. Your behavior. Your lifestyle. I don't know how you used to act before, but you ain't supposed to act that way today. <laughs> and some people are like, yeah, but I used to be a fornicator and a carouser. I used to be a fighter. I used to be a ballroom brawler. Okay, well, hallelujah. Thank God you ain't doing that no more, but what are you doing? I'm just a little bit rude every now and then. I just gossip every now and then. Hey, that bad. Come on, preacher. I just got a little bit of malice in my heart towards you. <laughs> just a little bit. You know, I heard this story one time. Whenever, whenever there was somebody, there were, there were some kids that were spending the night. It was a slumber party. Y'all might have heard this story. It was a slumber party, and they were watching a bad show on television, and the daddy called them. And it was, I think it was like a horror show, and I think it must have been a Christian dad. He's like, what are y'all doing watching this? And he's like, dad, it's just, it's not even that bad. It's just a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay. So he, the next morning, he had a pan of, of brownies waiting for him. Y'all heard that story? And he's like, y'all like them brownies? Oh, they're good. They were sitting there eating on them brownies. And he's like, yeah, I just put just a little pinch of dog poop out the back door. <laughs> It's just a little bit. And y'all didn't even know, huh? Y'all couldn't even tell that they had a little bit of gold. Okay. But that's the same way that we are. It's just a little bit of mouth. It's just a little bit of gossip. Just a little bit of something. something. Oh. The Lord don't want that stuff in there. He don't want your, our bad attitude. That's the old man. Amen. That's the old man. And listen, if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to do it, he'll free us up. Praise God. See, sometimes, sometimes people hurt us. Even in the body of Christ, not sometimes, all the time. Even in the body of Christ, people are going to hurt you. Because if people are full of jealousy, we, we don't have to be that way, church. You don't have to be that way. I don't have to be that way. We can really start to learn how to appreciate each other's gifts. We can really learn how to walk in unity and really become a body of Christ. I mean, the pinky needs the hand and the hand needs the pinky. Right? Uh, really. And we don't have to think more highly of ourselves than what we are. Amen. We can allow the Holy Spirit to do that deep work on the inside of us. And I can actually get to the place as a pastor where I get excited when I see someone else preach a good message. Hallelujah. That doesn't sound crazy. But do you realize that so many times ministers of the gospel struggle with that kind of thing? Yeah. Because they're like all thrown off in their heart. Like, oh, well, what was so good about their message? What was wrong with my message? Well, hold on a second, dude. It ain't even about you. That brother just preached the truth. You should be excited. You should be grateful that another person was speaking truth or that somebody laid hands on the sick and they recovered or whatever the case. We should be excited for Or the brothers and sisters got up here and they led worship for the kingdom of God. What is wrong with us? I know y'all never dealt with that. I'm just being real with you. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm the only bad guy in the house. Oh, help us, Lord. I know. I know. I'm hitting something because that wasn't my message. So here we go. The old man was gross corrupt according to the deceitful lust and instead be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put away that old conduct. Put away that old man. 
be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And understand that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, temperance, kindness, gentleness, hallelujah, endurance, hallelujah. These are the things of God. These are the things that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in your life. These are the things the Holy Spirit wants to produce in my life if we'll learn to let him have his will. Amen? I know it's, a, it's easy to preach it. But you know what? If we'll yield to the presence of the Lord, if we'll put the word of God in our heart, and if we'll start to really spend time in God's presence, let the Holy Spirit have his way with us, the cross becomes a reality in our life. The Holy Spirit will convict us when we're talking about our brother or sister behind their back. He'll convict us. And you know what we can do? We can stop right then and there. Yes. And we can practice something new. We can say, let's pray for that brother. Yes. Let's pray for that sister. And we can mean it. Yes. Amen? That's, that's a, look, that's gross. That's gross. Yes. Amen? Praise God. So, so. The old man put off that old mindset that's that's looking to wants to critique and criticize instead of be encouraging and to be excited about the things of God going on in people's lives. Amen. And that instead you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So the old man, so he comes in the express image of his person is what Jesus does. He's the new man. He comes in the express image of his, per, of his image. And look, he conforms us into the image of Christ. So, so we were born in the image and likeness of our father, Adam, born in sin. But then God sends his son who's in the image and likeness of the father. And then he dies for our sin. And then when we put faith in Christ, we become one with Jesus. We die with him. Amen. We're buried with him. A new man is resurrected the newness of life. Now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. And as we yield to the Holy Spirit, he's molding and conforming us into the image of Jesus. I can promise you if Jesus would have walked in that church, he would have, he would have. Probably done a, well. He probably would have done a whole lot more. He probably would have given him a word of prophecy or something. I'm sure. I thought that the Lord was about to give me a word of prophecy because I saw a mantle fall. But I think it had to do with He was showing me that the prophetic mantle had fallen in that church. But anyway, He didn't give me a word. But the point is that I promise you, Jesus wouldn't have went in there with a critical spirit. That's right. Come on. Praise God. Yeah. And I can't, and I got to be honest with you. I mean, you can hold it against me if you want to tomorrow. But a couple of years ago, I probably would have went in there with a critical spirit. I'm not proud of it. And I'm not the only one that has. Yeah. All right, that's another story. So how did this happen? We're closing right now. Uh, musician, y'all can come forward. Scripture says, I, I want to know how did this happen? How did, the, how did reconciliation take place? If sin separates, the blood reconciliates. How does it happen? It happens because a man must be born again. Maybe you're watching on video. But but this is the thing. Man must be born again. Jesus said it. Unless I, I, I except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Think about that. I mean, I, I think I counted 35 scriptures. <laughs> and you know one of the beautiful things is I'm not expecting you to write down all these scriptures. If you have, hallelujah, praise God. I will tell you this. I'm going to have all my notes up on the website. Did I tell you all we have a website? And then we have all the notes up there. All right. And all the notes are going to be up there. Praise God. But, 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 and, 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 but I didn't expect you to remember every single scripture. I was really trying to tell you a story out of the scripture. I was trying to back it up with the proof of, proof of truth. That, that sin separates man from the presence of God. But that God has been working on the earth to bring us back to the presence of God. Yeah. And the way that it happens is that the old man born of Adam has to be born again. And look what it says right here, though. I want you to pay attention to this one a little bit. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve 
sin. Do you realize we don't have to be enslaved to sin? Do you realize we don't have to get caught up in all that foolishness that they get caught up in in school? We don't have to get caught up in the foolishness of what our family members are still involved in or our friends are still involved in. We can. We do not have to be a slave to sin. We've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. And we can walk in the Spirit and in the power of God. This is the last one I want you to see right here. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. You no longer have to live a dead life. Amen. We now have been quickened or brought to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I'm going to worship the Lord for a little while. I want you to know the altars are open. Seriously, man, you might have walked in here this morning and you feel like the enemy has been beating you down. You feel like he's been trying to hold you down to depress you and oppress you. You got, you got something in your physical body that the enemy has been attacking you in. Listen, I want you to know we're here to pray for you and to believe God for him to do a miracle in your life. Amen. It's, he's the miracle worker. He's the miracle worker. Jesus died on the cross to be able to release miracles through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So whatever you're dealing with this morning, if you need prayer, we want to partner with you and we want to believe God with you. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.